Hey, welcome to Rise Church. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We believe that Jesus wants to do so much for you and through you, and we'd love to hear how he's working in your life. Please take a second to email your story to stories at rise-church.com. We hope you leave today feeling encouraged and uplifted. Enjoy the message. Let them do it. You can do it too. First time guests, you're in for a doozy. Today's a little bittersweet. We're wrapping up a series that we've been in since the month of March. You're gonna love this series. Come on, everybody that's been a part of it, you know the drill. The series is called I Pity the Fool. I pity the fool. And we named this series, yes, after Mr. T. And if you've been a part of our church and you still don't know who Mr. T is, I can't help you, okay? I can't, there's nothing I can do. And what we've been doing in this series is talking about how sometimes falling after Jesus is a little bit foolish and it's bittersweet today because this is like our seventh week of this series and I'm sad to see it go but man I have loved every minute of this series together it's been a faith series for the last time come on I hope that you have this verse memorized already this has been our theme verse we have read it every single week of this series if you don't have this one memorized this is a great one just to have in your back pocket for when the devil tries to mess with you come on let's read it together on the count of three here we go turn to your neighbor and say I'll do it if you do it Tell him you better do it because he said you should. All right, here we go. One, two, three. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Can I get a good amen? The message of the cross, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. If you don't know him, you look on and you think that's foolish. The world today looks on and goes, why are they showing up to church on their day off? They could have slept in, they could have gone fishing, they could have gone to the beach, they could have stayed home and, and done anything else. Why are they here? It's foolish, it doesn't make sense. Why do they give up their time? Why do they serve other people? Why do they give up their money, their resources, their finances? Why do they do, it's foolish. No, we know better. Amen. We used to think it was foolish. But then Jesus came into our lives and his death, burial, and resurrection changed everything for us. And now we know it ain't foolish. Man, it's the power of God. I can't do this life on my own. Come on, I gotta have Jesus in me. I tried, I tried it on my own. How'd that work out? Not good. Made a mess of things. Ruined my life. Was affecting other people's lives as well. Now I get to use my life for eternal purposes, for kingdom purposes. My life's been changed now. Come on, how many other people can I just point to Jesus and see him change as well? And so this series is all about foolishness and sometimes it looks foolish to follow God. Sometimes it feels foolish even as a follower of Jesus to put our faith in God, but come on, that's what faith is all about. I wanna close today out with a sermon title of this. You just had to be there. How many of you have ever been telling a story to somebody. I mean, I'm talking about something really good, like, like it's a worthwhile story, something funny that happened to you, something crazy you saw driving in, something you experienced driving on 10, I-10 here in, on the west side, like you're not gonna believe this, and you're telling the story to them. But you can tell, they're not tracking with you. They're not really giving you all of their attention, or, come on, this is probably better, they're not appreciating the story as much as they should. And at a certain point, you just get frustrated and you go, man, you just had to be there. I sometimes wonder if the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who wrote the account of Jesus's life, as if they were penning the paper, you know, just writing everything down that God was inspiring them to write, if they got to certain things that Jesus did. And they were like, man, like, how do we tell them this? Like, we were in a boat and we were kind of in the middle of a storm and things were kind of getting a little crazy. And then here comes Jesus walking on water, dot, 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 you just had to be there. <laughs> Today, my message is a faith message. I'm gonna go ahead and put all cards on the table and let you know where we're going today. I will first and foremost say this, and don't you dare amen this. I'm gonna preach a little shorter today. Don't, you better not. <laughs> I told you before, my son always says it, Dad, anytime you say you'll preach shorter, I always amen it. I'm like, boy, I'm gonna kill you. I'll break your ankles. Listen, I'm gonna preach shorter because at the close of today, this is what God's put on our heart. We're gonna invite some people down today that need a miracle in their life. We serve a miracle working God. We don't, we don't, we don't pursue the miracle, we pursue God. 
and in our pursuit of God, we ask him to do things in our lives that we cannot do on our own, and we say, God, we don't know how, God, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but God, would you do a miracle? And some of you are here today, and let's be real, man, like you need a miracle. Like outside of God just stepping into your life, like man, nothing's gonna change for you. And so what we're gonna do is the best we can is to put ourselves in a story today in the Bible. Because sometimes I think we can just read over the Bible and because we weren't there, we'll just read right past it like, oh, that's cool for them, but how does that relate to me? My staff was praying on Thursday morning. We were in the sanctuary, and after we got done praying, we just kind of rallied right here at the front, and I just said, all right, I want us just to name miracles in the Bible. And we're not just gonna rattle them off, we're gonna talk about them. So name a miracle and then just tell us how, how cool it is to you that God did that or that Jesus did that. And so we just started going, man, miracle after miracle. We even had some of our dream team volunteers that came and stood in the circles, ones that help us out on Thursday morning. And it was just powerful. And we were just going story after story. And one of the guys spoke up and said, man, what about the miracle of the blind guy where Jesus spit in the dirt? and made mud and rubbed it on his eyes, which doesn't make sense, right? One, gross, okay? <laughs> Two, like he's blind, like you would think rubbing mud in somebody's eyes would make it even worse, but remember, he's blind, so it doesn't get any worse than that, and Jesus heals him. And, and, and if you were to ask the guy, hey, would you have rather Jesus do it differently? He'd probably like, yeah, I didn't want spit mud in my eyes, but, but that's how God worked. And, and sometimes in our lives, I think we want Jesus to work like within our box, and we want him to do the thing the way that we think he should do it. And sometimes God has something different. Sometimes what he's doing and the way he wants to work in our life, it's going to look a little foolish. So today we're going to look at a very foolish story. If you grew up in church, you know it. If you didn't grow up in church, you probably already know this story anyways. But in Joshua chapter 6, we're going to talk about Jericho today. And it says this, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. Meaning the people of Jericho knew what God had done for the Israelites where he rescued them out of Egypt. And he knew that the Israelites were coming their way. And so the people of Jericho were like, they ain't gonna come after us. We're locking this thing down. No one went out and no one came in. Securely barred. Nobody's getting out. Nobody's coming in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hand. Now, I always tell you, Rise Church, you gotta read humor into the Bible from time to time because this is classic God right here. God says to Joshua, hey, you see that really tall wall that's surrounding this city and, and, and they've locked it down and, and nobody's coming out and, and nobody can even get in? Yeah, I gave that to you. That's yours. And if I'm Joshua, I'm probably thinking in that moment, really? That's, that's cool, God, like, how's that gonna work? We're gonna read on in just a little bit of how God planned it out, but sometimes God will tell us things and in a moment it feels foolish, but we would be fools not to believe God and trust him, amen? And so I've shared the story from time to time throughout the history of Rush Church of how our church combined with Macedonia Baptist Church, but so many of you are new to our church, um, you probably have never even heard this story, and I won't share with you all the details, because um, there's some details that don't need to be shared, but it's a great story, so let me share it one more time. God put it on my wife and I's heart to start a church. We're born and raised here on the west side of Jacksonville, and when God called us to start a church, we literally prayed this prayer, Lord, anywhere but the west side. Like, get us out of here. I'll, I'll go to the beach if you want me to, I guess. And the Lord said, no, this is exactly where I want you to be, because sometimes what we pray for, God has something better in store, amen? All right, so... So we're in our house, and we got people joining us, and we grow out of our house, and we move over to Eagles View Academy, which is right around the corner here on Ramona. And we were probably about seven months into being a church, and one Sunday, and this is how we would do it at Eagles View, because it's a school, we would have our team roll in on Saturday night, we had three trailers that we would unpack everything, and we would turn that school into a church. And then we would have church on Sunday morning, and then when we were done with church, We'd pack it all back up into our trailers and turn it back into a school. We did that every single weekend. About seven months in, a guy shows up that I knew, and he brings a Bible to somebody that worked at the school. 
And him and I start having some conversations and he tells me that they've been without a pastor for seven months. And some conversations begin to go on and, and they kind of went like this. Hey, Adam, would you want to maybe become the pastor of our church? And I said, I don't know if I wanna do that because I feel like God's called me to pastor my church over here. But then we start having these conversations of what would it look like if our two churches came together? And some of the leadership in their church that were trying to figure out what their next step was, because they didn't have a pastor, and, and who are we gonna do, what are we gonna bring in, they start coming together with some of our leadership, and we start having some conversations of, man, what would this look like? And some of the people that were a part of those conversations, I think just about every single one of them, man, they're still with us today. Some of my favorite people in the world. And so we're talking and saying, hey, if we come together, things are gonna be different. We're gonna make some changes. And they knew some things needed to happen and some things needed to change, but wasn't sure how the rest of the church was gonna respond to it. And so we meet together for, for weeks. It felt like forever. And then finally, we present it to the rest of Macedonia Baptist Church. And let's just say, that meeting didn't go great. We're just gonna leave it at that. It, it could have gone a lot better. And at the end of that meeting, both of us decide, hey, listen, I think that we could try to force this and make it work, but maybe God has something different he wants to do. And so let's go our separate ways. You guys keep going over here and we'll go back over to Eagles Field. And my wife, she's amazing. And um, if you think about her today, pray for her. She's up in New York right now. Um, this is how amazing of a preacher she is. She got invited to go up to New York uh, Friday night, she preached at a women's conference of 200 plus women up there. Um, and this morning, she's preaching at the church up in New York. She's amazing. I know, y'all are stuck with me. Pray for me though, because we're living off of fast food right now in the Peterson household. <laughs> Praise the Lord, she comes home tonight. All will be right in the world. And she says to me, days after that meeting didn't go well, she looks at me and she says um, something so stupid, so foolish. I think that building's still ours. And I said, you're crazy. That it, you were there, like, you, like this, did, this, is, this did not go well. About a month later, praise God, I came around and I walked into the house one day and I just said, babe, I think that's our building. She said, that's what I've been telling you for a month. I said, I know, it just took me a little longer to get there. And every single day, I lived right around the corner at the time. I would drive by this place on the way to our church Every single day that I drove by this church, I stretched my hand out towards this building. And I said, God, would you give it to us? God, if this is what you wanna do, would you give that building to us? We were a church, you know, that didn't have a, we didn't have a church building, and Eagles, you had a school throughout the week, so I didn't have an office. I'd sit in McDonald's, Popeye's, wherever I could, and most of the time, I sat in my car for my office writing sermons, and I would sit out in that field across the road and I would just stare at this building and I'd say, Lord, I believe that you're gonna give this to us. I believe that you're in this. I believe that it would be something special for two churches to come together. And for a year and a half, we prayed and believed and trusted and it felt so foolish until we get a phone call from some of the same people that said, I'm not so sure the first time around. Now they said, we know this is what God's calling us to do. And it was the most amazing thing. Some of the people, come on, yeah. Some of the people that were the biggest opponents for our churches coming together, man, they left. They were long gone, praise the Lord. Come on, we call that addition by subtraction. Sometimes, sometimes God just needs to remove those people from your life. And come on, two churches came together in unity. And anytime there is unity, God blesses that. He has to bless it. That's from his word. It's a promise. And the rest, the rest honestly, is, is history. God has done some amazing things. And, and I'm just so grateful for what the Lord did. But when we were in the middle of that, man, it just felt foolish to pray for something that didn't seem like it could happen. And for a year and a half, some of you are praying for something right now. And it's been a month. It's been six months, it's been a year, it's been five years, it's been a while, and you're praying, and you don't see anything happening. Matter of fact, maybe your situation's getting a little worse. I'll confess to you, I have prayed for peace in Ukraine. 
I haven't prayed every day. I really wish I could share that with you. Every day I've waked up and I've prayed. I haven't prayed every day, but I have prayed a lot for it. And it's frustrating because I know I'm not the only one praying. I know you are. I know the church around the world is. I know Ukraine is. And, and, and we're not seeing peace. We're actually seeing more chaos. And it's frustrating because it's like, God, where are you and what are you doing? And it feels foolish to wake up and pray and you see another headline. Some of you are in a place right now where you have an addiction in your life and you're praying and you show up to church and God, I want this out of my life and God wants to heal that addiction. He wants to bring freedom in your life, but you're just not seeing it yet. And you keep going back to that addiction and it just feels hopeless. It's not hopeless. There is victory in Jesus' name for you. And there's a miracle that God wants to work in your life. Some of you have motherhood in your heart. You just, for whatever reason, it's just not happening. Some of you, you're single and all you want is just a relationship. You want God to send you that right person. It's not a bad prayer to pray. God wired you that way. But right now you're just not seeing and that's frustrating. It feels foolish. Joshua, he probably knows exactly what you're thinking. Because God tells him, you see that, that barred city? Nobody can get in, it's yours. And then God gives him the battle plan for how they're gonna take Jericho, and God takes foolishness to a whole nother level. So let's read on. He says, I want you, this is God talking, I want you to march around the city. And if Joshua, you know, I'm Joshua, I'm like, oh yeah, we gonna, we gonna march, that's right, we gonna march. We, oh man, these, I got some boots on, and these boots are made for, and that's just what they're going to do. Come on, somebody. I knew we were a West Side church. Let's go. We're going to march around the city once with all the armed men. Oh, yeah, we're taking the armed men. Let's do this. We're going to do this for six days. Oh, yeah, six. That's the day of creation. Six days of creation. I got you, God. Have seven priests. Seven. That's a good number, too. Have seven priests carry trumpets and rams. Rams. This is the point where if I'm Joshua, I'm like, what are they going to do with a trumpet? Now, ram's horn, we might be able to oh, get some, my boy. What are we doing with the trumpet? In front of the ark, and on the seventh day, oh, yeah, seventh day, march around the city, what? Seven times? With the priests blowing the trumpets? God, it's getting a little weird. Let's keep reading. When you hear them sound a long blast of the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And if I'm Joshua, I'm thinking, God, I think you skipped a step. <laughs> How are the walls coming down? When are we getting the tanks? When are we getting the catapults? Like when, how, the walls are gonna come down from us yelling? That's a little foolish, right? Joshua probably knew that God worked in foolish ways. Because Joshua wasn't always the leader of the Israelites. Joshua used to be second in command to a guy named Moses. And he saw God move through Moses in the Israelites. See, Joshua was a part of that group of Israelites that were trapped in Egyptian slavery for 400 years. And he saw Moses show up on the scene talking about Pharaoh, you better let my people go or God's gonna get you. And he saw the power of God change Pharaoh's heart and free them from slavery. But then he saw Pharaoh change his mind and start chasing them down. And then he saw Moses stick his hands out over the Red Sea and the waters part and Joshua walked across on dry ground. Saw a miracle, saw, saw something that didn't make sense to him. And then Joshua was in the desert because the Israelites didn't believe God that he had a promised land and they doubted God and so they had to wander in the desert. And Joshua saw God lead them in the desert with a pillar of cloud that would just lead them that they followed during the day. And then at night that pillar of cloud turned into a pillar of fire that would lead them. That's, where are you guys going? Wherever this fire thing goes. He saw Moses walk up to a rock one time because he was frustrated and he hits the rock with a stick and water just starts coming out. 
as foolish. Joshua was a part of the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert that every morning they would wake up hungry and God would supernaturally provide for them a food called manna. Where did it come from? God brought it. The first ever Uber Eats from the Lord himself. <laughs> you know what manna was translated? It was translated as, what is it? They didn't even know what it was, like, like God provided it. And so at the end of the day, this battle plan seems foolish, but Joshua had already seen God do some foolish things. I, I wonder if what you're praying for right now feels foolish, but if you just could remember what God's already done for you, you would remember, oh, God's already worked in some foolish ways before in my past. So if he's done it then, then surely he can do it now. And so now Joshua gets the battle plan from God, but now he's in a little bit of a tight spot because what does he have to do now? He's got to go back to the Israelites and he's got to tell them the battle plan. All right, everybody rally up. Here's, here's what we're going to do. And they're all like, I still don't know about this guy, Joshua. Moses was a great leader. I don't know about him. And he says, we're going to walk around the city. People of Israel are like, yeah, we are. Let's go. Put all the armed men over here. I need some trumpet players, and I need some ram's horns. They're like, it's getting weird. Well, what are we going to do, Joshua? We're just going to walk around the city one time. And people of Israel are like, we are going to freak them out. They're not going to have a clue what's happening. And then we're just going to leave. And then they're like, but what are we going to do the next day, Joshua? Same thing. The next day, same thing. Again, six days. And then on the seventh day, oh, that's what we were waiting on. We were waiting on the seventh day. What are we going to do on the seventh day, Joshua? Woo, well, we're going to walk around it seven times on the seventh day. And then those guys with the trumpets are going to play, and we're going to shout, and the walls will come down. Right? This guy's lost it. But he's the leader, so let's go. And so they start walking around the city of Jericho. They walk around it one time on the first day, and they leave. And they come back the second day, and the third day, and the fourth day. And the people of Jericho are probably looking, going, what are they doing? The people of Israel are probably thinking, what are we doing? And every step that they took, they probably felt more foolish. Every step, every lap around Jericho, they probably thought, this is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? They probably thought to themselves right here, we must be out of our mind. You ever said that to yourself before? Anybody want to be honest? Trying to get along with that coworker at your job that just drives you crazy? Man, I must be out of my mind to try to think that they're actually going to listen to me one time. That kid that just drives you crazy. I must be out of my mind with this kid. I must be out of my mind. Some of you in this place, I want to I wanna challenge you. Because I think this is exactly where I think you need to get out of your mind because your mind has you trapped because your mind can only see what's going on in front of you. Your mind has limitations. It can only process what you see in front of you. You need to get out of your mind and you need to get the mind of Christ on the inside of you. So this is why God said in Isaiah, in Isaiah, he says this, my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. And I'm not just saying it. Come on, Michael Scott. I'm declaring it. If you got that joke, you know where I'm going. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are, here it is, my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In your mind, you look at your situation and you think, there's no way this can change. There's no way this doctor's report can get better. This is a bad report. How can I get a good report? No, God has something he wants to do. His ways are higher than yours. And if you think, and I must be out of my mind for believing God for this, you're not out of your mind. That's called faith. 
faith isn't just like this, like, say it and spray it, blab it and grab it. I said it, so the Lord's gonna do it. That's not how it works. Faith is, my God is a way maker. Meaning, the, the, the definition is in the name. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. The Israelites stuck between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies. What do we do? Well, uh, let's just move the water. Y'all can walk. Some of you need a miracle today. A miracle from God. You need a physical miracle. You have a diagnosis from a doctor. It's not looking good. Maybe they've even given you a timeline. And I, I just believe God, come on somebody, listen to me. We see it all throughout scripture. God is a miracle working God that people just touch people and they were healed. Does that mean he heals everybody? No, no, but it doesn't mean that he can't heal some people. We're just gonna pray and ask that he would. Some of you, your healing isn't physical, it's mental. You are overwhelmed with anxiety. You are overwhelmed with worry and stress. You're losing sleep at night. It's affecting your relationships. And God, the miracle God wants to do in you, he wants to give you peace. Amen. Some of you, the miracle that you need, man, it is an addiction that needs to be broken in Jesus. You don't have the strength to do it. Only Jesus does. Some of you, it's a relationship that just, outside of God, that relationship's not coming back together. Power of God, come on, he can bring unity to something that just feels dead. I felt in my heart specifically that somebody in this place, you need the miracle of forgiveness towards somebody that's hurt you. You've been harboring bitterness in your heart towards them. You've tried, you really have. I'm telling you, forgiveness is supernatural. You cannot do it on your own. It is a supernatural thing that the power of God in you will do and bring healing to your heart for whatever it is that they said or whatever it is that they did. Only God can do that for you. I'm just praying today that God would work a miracle in some of your lives. I'm gonna invite the band to come up and as we close out, I wanna share with you probably one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And uh, it's found in the Old Testament, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you grew up in church, you know this story. If you didn't grow up in church and you don't know the story, you're gonna love it. If you're pregnant, those are solid names, man. <laughs> a little shatty, a little, <laughs> little Abednego, let's go. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were Hebrews. And Babylon comes along and captures them and enslaves them. Changes their names. That wasn't even their original name. That's why they're jacked up names, because the Babylonians gave them names. And the king of Babylon creates this golden statue. And he says, every time the music plays, I want you to bow down and worship this false god. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're young, man. They're probably teenagers. In my mind, I like to picture that they said to the king, ah, these aren't working good these days. We're not gonna be able to bow down. Matter of fact, the only one we will bow down to is the living God. King Nebuchadnezzar said, well, that's, that's gonna be a deal breaker. If you don't bow down and worship this image, I'm throwing you into the fire. You're gonna be, you're gonna be killed. They respond with these words. The God we serve save us from that fire. He cre our God created fire. He can save us from fire. But even if he doesn't, and that's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego giving God an out. Going, well, if he doesn't, it's cool. No, they said, even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. That's not an out. That's faith. Hey, even if God doesn't come through like we would like him to do, like, hey, I know we're about to be killed, but if God doesn't save us, Man, our faith isn't in this world. It's in heaven and in eternity. And that's a miracle in and of itself. 
Can I share with you something, man? We had so many people in the recent history of our church, I'm talking like within the last year, get diagnosed with cancer. And man, we prayed, we believed, and asked God to work a miracle in their lives. And they died, man. I'm talking, we did funeral after funeral after funeral. And I'm starting to get a little mad. I'm starting to get a little frustrated. Like, God, come on, I, I know you're a miracle working God. I know you, I know cancer's not greater than you. Their miracle wasn't here on earth, it was in heaven. But then in the past five months, and we have seen cancer gone in Jesus' name in multiple, multiple people's lives here within just our church. Because sometimes we see the miracle this side of heaven, sometimes we don't. But it's not gonna stop me from praying. And so our prayer, I just wanna build your faith this morning. Our prayer is this, God, we know you can do anything. We know that you can come and provide financially for us. You can come through in ways that maybe we didn't see coming. God, we know you can heal our body, soul, and spirit. God, we know that you can heal relationships. We know you can do it all. But God, if there's a different way you wanna do it than the way that we're praying, then do that. Because your ways are always better. Your, way, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Your ways are higher than our ways. Like, we, we're not you. We trust you. But we're just gonna ask. We're just gonna seek. We're just gonna knock and ask that the Lord God of heaven and earth would move miraculously today. And if this is different than what you grew up in, it, and it's like, this feels weird. It's not weird. Just read your Bible, okay? It's all throughout the Bible. The person that makes it weird, his name is Satin. He's the one that doesn't want us to call upon the power of God. What, what, what did we just read? The message of the cross is foolish to those that are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved, we know it's the power of God. Hey, some of you, the best miracle you need right now is salvation. You're, you're the one that looks on at this and says, this is foolish. It's not foolish. It's, it's a power that you need more in your life more than you'll ever know. Call upon Jesus as your savior to forgive your sins, heal you, to make you new, wash you clean. Surrender to him as Lord and savior today. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna worship. We're gonna sing how this is a house of miracles. But what we're also believing is this, this house, this is a house of miracles. And God wants to do it in somebody's life today. And would you stand to your feet? As we worship, I'm just gonna invite you to come down here to the altar. Thanks for watching today. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. If our church has had an impact on you and you'd like to support all that Jesus is doing in this place, you can do so by going to rise-church.com slash give and select the giving option that best suits you. Thanks so much for joining us online and we hope you have a blessed week.